you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you to uh, Laura for an absolutely beautiful introduction. I am, um, not that I compare myself in any way, but I once read that after a lovely introduction, Winston Churchill said he could hardly wait to hear what he had to say. <laughs> I always think good introductions should come after in case people say, well, you weren't that hot. <laughs> I want to thank the Lanham Foundation very, very much for this wonderful opportunity to be with you and to just tell you that I feel like I'm in heaven. This is the most beautiful auditorium. This is just an absolutely lovely old theater. Thank you to whoever had the good grace to restore this beautiful place. It just gives one hope um, for our species, does it not? Well, I'm uh, going to just give you a wee bit of background about where I think we are with the wa global water crisis ecologically and in human top terms. Talk a little bit about the situation here in the U.S. and then I'll be a little more hopeful because I actually believe that hope is a moral imperative <laughs> and that we actually want to um, be thinking in terms of what we can do. And I want to start off by saying this Crisis is not something that we, we cannot deal with. We absolutely have all the tools we have if we do the right things. We need political will. And I kind of see the global water crisis as being about um, three years, maybe five years behind the climate change crisis in terms of general consciousness. So this is just part of this odyssey that we're on. Okay, just the first thing to do is to really get into our heads how little their amount of, of water, their fresh available fresh water there is on Earth. We all learned, almost no matter where we grew up, that you couldn't destroy water because it's part of a hydrologic cycle. There's a finite amount. It goes round and round and round. It can't go anywhere, so you can use all you want because it just goes back and falls back as rain. We all learned that about grade six. Our teachers weren't lying, but they were wrong. And this is a really important thing for us to disengage our heads from. We have to put, press the delete button on that lesson. If you were to put all the world's water stock into one gallon bucket, the amount of available fresh water would be just over half a teaspoon. Or another way of, of looking at it, I have a, um, a PowerPoint that shows the Earth dried up. So that's how big the Earth is in this, on this scale all brown and dried up. The water we've taken off is beside it, and that's about this big. So the earth is this big, the water is this big. The amount of available fresh water is a tiny blue dot you can hardly see. I want to remind you all there'll be a book signing afterwards. So if you want to get your hands on Maud's books, they'll both, I think, both Blue Gold and Blue Covenant will be available in the back. You reminded me of another quote as you ended with quotes um, from my dear, much missed June Jordan. We have choices and capitulation is only one of them. <laughs> I like that quote. Listening to you, um, Native peoples often tell us there's a spiritual component to our treatment of this planet. Is there a spiritual component to our disdain for water or the way we use it and abuse it? That's a lovely uh, first question, and I, I, I believe truly that, that we do, and I'm guilty as charged until I, I entered the, the world of water, got water on the brain. Yeah. Uh, we've disassociated ourselves so much, in, in our, in, particularly in the first world, in, in the global north. Um, anything that we run out of, technology will fix. Mm -hmm. you know? So in, in our country, we had the largest collapse of a fishery in the world with the cod fishery collapsing. There were so many cod once off the coast of Newfoundland that they say that the fishermen used to be able to go out and walk on them on water when they were spawning. And there are no photos because it was before, it was, but there's paintings of that. And uh, they're gone. So we thought, well, everybody, okay, well, let's just take the Chilean sea bass. Oop, they're, they're gone. Well, what's under them? There's another fish underneath. And there's just this notion that it's endless. For me, on a very personal level, when I set out on this journey, and it was all political at first, it was about the politics of water, it soon became about something else. And that was taught to me by people in communities around the world, usually indigenous communities or, or uh, farming, small farmers, local um, peasant farmers and so on. I can remember being in one community in Bolivia where they ha all the water that this family had was in a, a little jug really for that day. They, had to, they only came in twice a week, they, a truck would come. Sometimes they could afford to buy it, sometimes they couldn't. 
And yet when I left, she gave me some water. And this was their gift, all she had to give me to thank me for what we're trying to do with them. And, and uh, so I, I'm beginning, I, I set out on a journey to understand um, that this, the, every ancient people, every indigenous community, all of our, historically all of our religions are all grounded in a respect for water. Mm-hmm. And angry water gods, we have a great mythology from the Inuit of the north that when you when you murder or when you do something terrible, that it's a, it's a, the, vengeful, the vengeful goddess is a water goddess who will come and pull you down uh, because she, she, you know, it, it, water has great power and we've, we've lost our respect for water. We've lost our respect for its, its place in nature and it, we just simply have to get it back. That's what offends me mostly about bottled water is in containing it in plastic, which is fossil fuels and chemicals and... I think it hurts water to do that. And it actually does, by the way. They have a wonderful Canadian scientist, Bill Schottick, who's doing work in Germany. And he-